Looking to learn life lessons without going through the experience? You've come to the right place. Welcome to Hidden Struggles with your host, Lady C. Hey, this is Lady C. Welcome to Hidden Struggles. And my upcoming guest is Chef Nelly. Hello. Welcome to the program, Chef Nelly. We're going to talk all about your life and the things that you've been through and, and what you're being, what you're doing to be an entrepreneur and, you know, how you got to where you are today. So you want to give us a little bit of background about your, your business and how you got into the uh, cooking industry? Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me. So honestly, it started from many years of doing different catering businesses, different ideas, and they just they weren't sticking, you know, and and so I had to find what is going to work with these people. (laughs) So I just on a whim um, decided to start my social media page. I went on Instagram and said, you know what? I'm just going to throw some ideas out there and I'm going to see what works with the audience. Um, And so I said, but I don't want to just only narrow myself down. So I said, let's do like odds and ends, odds and eats. So I said, okay, let's go ahead and start this. I'm going to just show people what you can do with leftovers. Let's just teach people that random onion, that jar of, uh, you know, pasta sauce. Let's turn it into something. Didn't tell my family, my husband, anybody just went and started it. And surprisingly enough, people gravitated towards that. Um, and I've done many different concepts and they just never stuck. And I'm, and I'm not still to this day really sure why some of them didn't. But, uh, you know, all of a sudden I just started getting this following and it went great. Now, um, I'm originally from Michigan. So um, I want to say, too, that might be another reason why maybe it didn't stick. I was around a lot of my peers, a lot of people I'm familiar with. So it just maybe wasn't catching that way. So I relocated to Arizona and just food out here is an absolute phenomenon. Um, People love it. They gravitate towards it. So it just took right off as soon as I decided to pack my bags and just throw caution to the wind and say, let's see where I could go with this business in Arizona. And, And it's just been going great. That is excellent. What do you think you had to overcome when you were when you first started, when you first got to Arizona? Was it like it took me a minute to like survey the land to see, you know, where I, where you would be going or, you know, how did you jump off into what you're doing? Oh, goodness. It was actually a rocky start. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Um, I didn't realize how competitive food was out here. Um, I didn't really, like I said, I didn't really get that competitiveness too much in Michigan um, with with foodies and chefs of that sort. So um, as soon as I got out here, I started cooking and I started doing reviews of restaurants and actually restaurants started reaching out to me and saying, hey, we'll give you a free so and so if you do a review, post it, whatever, you know, so and, and so on. So I didn't know, I had no clue that that was competitive. So here I am naive coming into this out here, like, oh my goodness, okay, I'm gonna meet all these awesome foodies, all these awesome chefs, and we're gonna get together and we're a family. And it did not go that way. Actually, I hosted, I tried to host an event um, with other foodies, invited about 15 people because we were still in the middle of, you know, the pandemic. So. I invited about 15 foodies and one showed up, one. And apparently it was because in the foodie community, there's others that don't like this one or don't like that one, or they feel like you're their competition, so they don't want to get too close. So that was a real struggle, honestly, with me starting in the beginning out here is I couldn't figure out where to fit. I said, I'm a chef, but I'm also doing reviews of restaurants and, you know, things to do when you're out, just lifestyle, pretty much. I had no idea it would, it would kind of backfire in the beginning of the start of all of this. And it, and it really, um, it took me, it took me down a little bit. I was a little upset and a little sad. Like, I just thought we could all come together and <laughs> be food, you know, and Right. And it, it did not um, it didn't start off that way. So when I first got odds and eats, Nellie's odds and eats together, 
it was definitely a struggle out here um, in the very beginning. But I overcame that um, by just continuing to put myself out there. Um, I didn't allow it to get me discouraged um, because that's what they would want, you know, in the end is give it up and, and keep it pushing because we've got thousands of foodies out here. What makes you any different? Exactly. So, yeah. So I didn't want to get discouraged and I just kept pushing and seeing what boundaries I could cross and, and what really works with people. And I didn't allow them to get me down. Um, I took that day. <laughs> sad and moved on and and here we are you know and now it's just been growing wow so now i saw i saw you on uh your facebook page and you were out in vegas as well right because i saw yes you want to go to vegas so you so you're taking like what day trips and stuff to vegas and stuff correct so so I'm everywhere. Um, and that's another thing I travel and cater as well. And also I, I, um, I travel frequently. So I do like to give people those perspectives of what can I do when I'm there? Hey, I've never been here. What is there to do? So I like to give everyone those options of seeing, okay, hey, I'm planning an upcoming trip to LA or I'm planning an upcoming trip to Vegas or Seattle. And I've been there. So let me show you what the rooms look like, what uh, budget you should have, um, what deals you can get. Is this restaurant worth it or not? You know, so I, I really like to give people those perspectives as well. Um, and, and that's my way of networking. A lot of people say, you know, well, how are you going here? And how are you going there? Why are you doing this? And honestly, it's to get my name out there. Right. You, you know, you lose every chance you don't take. So sometimes it's just on a whim. I say, you know what? This is going on in this town. Let me go ahead and, and see how that works out with my schedule. And I'm just going to go. And half the time I just pat my daughter up and, <laughs> and, we, and we head out. And it's lovely. You know, the responses I get from people from that's, that, too. They awesome. never know. What about, let me ask you this. What about your, your first big catering gig? You know, how did you end up getting that? Oh, so that was actually through networking as well. Um, when I moved down here, I had joined a Facebook group of other moms just looking, you know, for a support group. I didn't know where to start. Okay. And so I ended up saying, you know what? I'm going to host a brunch for these women we're all moms. We're tired. <laughs> you know, we work. Right. We're hardworking women in general, in general, even if you're not a mother, like you're just hardworking in general. So I said, you know what? Let me say I'm going to throw an event. I'm going to cater and I'm going to let these women taste my food, see how they like it, see the response. And through that way, having women coming over, it just took off. Then they started telling other people about my business and then also through Instagram they would start following me their friends would start following me and I had a woman reach out to me and say hey um I live in Seattle but I'm going to be in Sedona Arizona could you cater for me and I was, I was like what <laughs> and she she found me through mutual friends and followed my Instagram, saw my work, and said, I would love it if you could cater an event for just six of my friends. Keep it simple, barbecue theme. I said, absolutely. And from there, now I've just gotten people, hey, I live in this state. Are you able to come here? Um, I actually went to LA and did a catering gig, a seafood boil there, and, and they loved it. And so it was just a trickling effect. Wow, so you're not just local, you're all over the, the area. Wherever, wherever I, people need a, a, a chef or a caterer, you're willing correct. to. Correct. Okay. Well, yeah. that's different because I don't think a lot of people do that. So that's a nice little niche. Yeah, yes, it is. And traveling, um, being a private chef, a lot of um, them don't understand or utilize what they can do. And, and it's like, don't narrow yourself down to just where you live. There are people that will pay that price to fly you out and have you cook if what if your work is great. Because sometimes they, they, they aren't having luck in their local areas finding what they can. Or there's people that do travel and they might be in my area and say, hey, I'm not from here. 
but I have an Airbnb at so-so-and-so, could you come? So I really hate narrowing myself down. I will go wherever the wind blows me, wherever they want me, <laughs> I am there. That is so good. Now, I, I noticed that on your page, you also have your own spices. Yes, as you mentioned that, my um, Chef Nelly Anytime seasoning over here. So, and I do have that listed on the back for everybody too, so they know what you're getting in here. But I've got um, seasoned salt, paprika, cumin, lemon pepper, uh, garlic. Uh, I mean, it's just, you open this bottle, it, it's an array of... <laughs> Just flavors, um, oregano, basil, and you can use this on anything. And that's why I call it anytime seasoning, because you can use it on meats, uh, poultry, uh, fish, seafood, vegetables, anything. Literally, you can put that on it. Um, I do have uh, two other seasonings as well. Um, I sold out of them, so I don't have those available right now, but um, that one, I have a smoked out seasoning. It's a sweet chili lime. It's gluten-free. Um, that's more for your barbecue. Um, if you kind of want to give something a little smoky flavor, then I also have a gluten-free and salt-free anytime seasoning for those who are more sensitive. You know, you have to think about those things. A lot of chefs don't. Right. And one of the things I want to make uh, clear to my audience is that Chef Nelly didn't just go to a culinary school and learn how to cook. She comes from a family of cooks. Yeah. You know, she got way back. So it was not like she just woke up one day and said, I wanted to cook. You know, you oh, want to talk no. a bit about your family history in the food industry? Absolutely. I mean, we come from a long, a long line of, of great women um, in my family that have been cooking, um, been showing us kids ever since we were little, I think we started off what shucking corn and, and popping peas and, you know, it, it started that way. And then it worked up to being shown how to make lasagna, how to make pancakes, how to just little things, you know, helping out in the kitchen. And so it started there. And that was about, I'd say I started seriously when I was probably about nine or 10. About nine or 10, I was shown, um, yeah, these are, these are easy meals. You can pop in the oven or fix yourself and you'll be okay. And that was great. So I didn't even want to be in culinary. I did not want to cook. I actually wanted to be in the arts, uh, performing arts and dance and things like that. So once I was about 17, um, because I started college a little early. Um, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. You know, I said, ah, dance is great, but what can, what else can I do? And there was a culinary program and I said, let's just give it a go <laughs> and, and see what happens. I said, because growing up, I remember doing so many little things, you know, with the women in my family and us coming together and cooking these meals and having family over family barbecues, you know, and it could have just been even something so simple as helping to make the barbecue sauce. You know, it, it's those things that you retain and they stick with you forever, no matter what your, your path may be. And in my own opinion, because I didn't really even, I went to culinary school and I didn't even get a passion for cooking until after culinary school, <laughs> ironically. Oh my goodness. So then what made you want to go to culinary school then? It was just, I, well, the, the college I was going to, they had actually gotten rid of the performing arts program as I was getting started. So that's why another reason I said, what am I going to do? I said, I can cook a little bit, and, but I, and I don't want to be a nurse blood no way <laughs> so those were like the only two main programs they had at this community college so i said well they they look really intimidating those hats the chef coats the neckerchiefs oh i said i don't know and i just went for it and i said you know what let's just give it a try we'll do one semester see if it works and i and i loved it i did I loved my chefs. I loved my mentors. I loved my classmates. But it just, I don't know, it wasn't clicking at the time. It, it, and I was so young too. So I was still trying to grasp 
What is it that I want to do? I love this. It's cool. Um, but I said, ah, I don't know. The passion still isn't there just yet. Um, but the good, so thing became, is, the good thing is you graduated from the correct. Yes. So at some point you, you fell in love with something, right? It, exactly. So I, I said that, you know what? I, I do enjoy cooking. So I enjoyed it. Didn't love it. If that makes any sense, it just, I had fun doing it. And I think that that's what it was. The program was a lot of fun and I highly suggest people just do it because they even have pastry programs that you don't need. You don't get a, You don't have to do a degree. You could just do it for fun. Right. And I love that. Um, the personalities I met, I'm still very close with a lot of my old culinary buddies because we've been through a lot of the same struggles. Um, but it was just, once I got you know, the things they teach you in culinary school, you just don't use on a regular basis in your everyday kitchen. That's why I couldn't connect with it. Um, because once I finally got into working in the kitchens, I said, I'm not using anything that we learned in class. So what was the point? So I think that that's another reason why I said, OK, I'm, I just don't get it. <laughs> You know what? If you can travel, like, I don't know how many people can travel way back to the Julia Child days <laughs> and even the Emeril Lagasse, because well, these are two different, you know, eras of cooks or Correct. chefs, I should say chefs. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I didn't like about certain chefs were they always introduced ingredients that I had never heard of before or that I couldn't get at my local grocery store. Correct. So like, why are you putting this out here? And we can't even find it, you know? Correct. And so that probably was a lot of the things that you were having happening as well, right? Correct. Absolutely. I, I said, you know, I'm working with, I live in the, in the Midwest, <laughs> you know, um, there's only so many ingredients we're going to be working with, you know, our, our cooking style. And, and that's another thing I've learned even from moving out further West is different um, cuisines and how to cook them properly. But Living in the Midwest, it's like, okay, we do comfort, you know, foods. We don't dive too deep into any of the real top-notch fancy stuff. You'll have a few restaurants sprinkled in there that do that. Um, and they're only successful because of their clientele right. th that they have. Not because of the food. It's because of their clientele. So that was, that was the struggle. I said, when am I going to cook with any of these things? This isn't something that I eat or anybody else eats on their normal, regular basis. So that was another thing that kind of took me away from it is, I don't know. It didn't stop me from learning about those ingredients, mm -hmm. but it definitely was just something that I couldn't put out for, for my audience that people would gravitate to. Right. Now, what is your goals? I mean, do you plan on remaining a personal chef? Do you think that if you got a call from a celebrity that wants a personal chef, you would take that opportunity or are you just going to keep keep hanging out solo? As I am going to always continue being a private chef. Um, and I'll dig in and dive into that. I don't want to like go ahead of myself, but I'll dive into as why I want to remain um, a private chef. But no matter if I have my own restaurant, which I would love, uh, my own restaurant, my own food truck, the, the limit is never endless with that. That is the goal. I would love that. Um, I love the look on people's faces when they have my food. Um, I see how it makes them happy. Just food makes people feel good. You know, and that's all I'm trying to do. So that is my end goal, restaurant, food truck. Absolutely. Um, but I will never, ever, ever stop being my own boss, stop being a private chef, um, because I mean, in a, the realistic part of that is the money's in it. <laughs> I mean, you're missing out on an opportunity if it's if it's what you do and someone's calling you and saying, hey, I have an event in two months. Can you? you know, Yes. Why not? You know, I, I just don't feel like turning down those opportunities. It, it, it's just not something I'm ready to do yet. I'm not ready to give that up. Um, I've been catering for about 10 years, I want to say 10 or 11 years I've been catering. 
Um, and I've been working in restaurants for 15 years. Okay. What was that like working for somebody else? That's that is why I will remain a private chef is because working for other people was the worst struggle as a female chef. Um, chefs in general, we have all, are all um, our own battles. But as a female chef, I mean, it goes back to I was 17 getting my first. I was on the line. I was a grill cook at a chain restaurant. And I go in for my interview. And the first thing the manager says when he interviews me is he looks me up and down and says, mm, you sure you want to be a chef? I said, well, yes, <laughs> that's why I applied. He said, but you're too pretty. Um, are you sure you don't want to be a server? I said, absolutely not. And at that time, I had already done two to three serving gigs before I finally said, I just want to be back at the house. So I already did serving at fine dining and, and little mom and pop diners and everything. I hated it. I wanted to be behind the scenes and cook for people. So that was my first interaction trying to get into this cooking world. And it was just so ironic to me because I thought people wanted women in the kitchen, you know? <laughs> Wait, well, let me say this. Don't they say, um, he's going to um, go out and make the, and, and, and um, make the money and bring the bacon home and you're going to cook the bacon in the kitchen. And then you go to culinary school and then you wake up to the reality of, wait a minute, we don't want y'all in here. What's all, what's that all about? What's going on with yeah. the women in the, in the um, being a chef? What's the struggles? I, I don't know if it's intimidation because we've always been in the kitchen, always been the ones that cook. Um, so I don't know if, it, if it's maybe other people feel like they have something to prove because this has always been our staple is cooking. Um, but in culinary school, I didn't see it too much. Honestly, I saw more women in culinary school back then. Now, this was in 2007. So I don't know what it's like now, but um, there were more women. Um, than men. So when I actually graduated, got my degree and went out and saw that, oh, it's just a bunch of men. Where are the women? I said, why am I not seeing more women in this industry? And I was so confused for many years until I kept getting more kitchen jobs and more bad things kept happening behind the scenes that people just are not familiar with or even would think that it would happen. And so, the, I mean, like I said, it started with that um, instance. And as I kept going to different restaurants, um, oh goodness, I, I even had a, a female boss actually let me go because I was a woman. She didn't want any women in the kitchen, none whatsoever. <laughs> Oh my God. What was that? That was I. Mean, she is a woman, so she's discriminating against other women. Correct. And that was a very strange, I mean, her business obviously failed. Um, she had three of them and they all failed. Um, because of that mentality, you're you're selling yourself short when you don't bring in these awesome, just killer women chefs because we are fierce and we work hard and we take our job serious. And I'm not saying men don't either, but I'm just saying this is a common issue in the restaurant industry. Um, uh, um, sexual assault is very common um, as well in in that industry because they kind of look at you as a weaker. Um, and that they feel that they can get away with anything. So they'll try things here and there, little things and little jokes or whatever. And then sometimes then they take it too far. Um, and that's happened at at least two or three restaurants I've worked, in, worked at. That's personally happened to me. I've gone to authority, but nepotism was alive and well. <laughs> so when you, when you have, when you have your family and your aunt and your, your, your cousin as your boss, who am I? I'm no one. They could let me go and, and replace me easily. Getting, getting kitchen help is, is hard, but it's not at the same time. You are extremely, um, replaceable and, I've just never really let it hold me down. I never let it stop me. That actually fueled my fire 
to keep going in this industry. And, and sadly, I mean, women just keep getting discriminated against. And, and when we're really out here just trying to make an honest living, we just want to come into work and do our job. Um, you don't really commonly hear about women doing too much to the men, right? <laughs> you know, in that, in that field. But it's happened too. It's happened as well. Do you think that because, you know, there's always been a history where men make more money than women. Mm -hmm. And I do know that in fine dining, there's a lot of money that can be made in those restaurants. So it could be, could it be the fact that the money is there for the chef or the culinary chef in the restaurant? Oh, the money, the money is there for the men. Um, I had worked a job where I was making at least four to six dollars less than the men. And I had more experience. So the money is there absolutely to go and do a nice fine dining restaurant and get your pay. But it comes with a price every single time. If you want to go in there and you want to make good money, you're going to have to do a lot of things you're not proud of to get ahead pretty much. And that's just how it is as a woman in this industry. It's very sad that I could walk in with a culinary degree with 15 years of cooking experience. I've worked in a list of restaurants, having my own business, and they will start me at the bottom. But here comes the chef that walks in off the street. He's, you know, worked at a couple mom and pop diners, you know, dirty chef coat. No, you know what I mean? And right. he'll make six more dollars than I will. So it's just so terrible that they would just discriminate like that. Yeah. And, always, and, and this has been a because I, I know you and I have had a conversation about this before. And so there's an organization of women as well. You want to talk about them and what they're yes. talking about? Now, there is a great organization um, that I work with, MAP. Um, I just started working with them. So they're a great organization um, that works with women in the culinary field. And basically, it, it's like a support group um, in a sense that you're not alone. This person went through that as well. And what we're here to do is know that we're going to support each other. We're going to lift each other up. We're going to get our name out there. We are going to be heard. You're not going to silence us of the struggles that we have been through and everything else that we have been through. They're giving, they're giving young chefs all the tools in the world to know how to start your own cookbook, start your own podcast, start your, you know, your own brick and mortar, your own restaurant. They are giving you all those tools for free. All you have to do is sign up and um, every like two to three weeks, they actually host webinars with amazing female chefs from Top Chef, from Hell's Kitchen, um, from a lot of other female chefs from the Food Network and any of these other cooking shows that you see. They come in as guest speakers and they tell you, they give you behind the scenes of what happened on those shows, um, how they were discriminated against and how you can avoid that. Um, and the woman, Joanna, who, who runs this whole organization, she actually um, made a movie, A Fine Line. And that goes to show you all the behind the scenes of what really goes on with us as female chefs and what we struggle with. It is great. And I suggest everybody look up MAPP, M-A-P-P, -P, Impact. Um, if you are a female in the food industry, it will change your life. It has for me tremendously. Do you see that they're making any progress with this um, since you've been, you know, like, because how long have they been in operation? A year. They've been in operation, um, I want to say a year or two. Oh, so they're relatively new. Yes. So we really can't really do that much measuring as to how much progress they're making. Right. But but in that little amount of time. So that movie that was made was featured actually on PBS. OK. Um, and it actually did um, get a lot of traction in that small amount of time. Um, the fact that just a regular woman like me in the food industry was able to publish a movie, get a whole organization and bring in these chefs, these well-known female chefs and have them speak and give us this free advice is just astonishing in itself because 
I don't know if I could do it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so hats off to her for organizing something so great that people are not aware of at all and bringing that awareness. I think that that's really good awareness because I wasn't aware of it, but I do know that when I would go to fine dining, I noticed that there were a lot of men that were the, the main chefs. And I yes. never really thought anything about it. And I thought it was just normal that she would go to a restaurant and the chef would be a, a, a male. You know? Yeah. And, and that's the general um, idea that people have uh, when you go out to a restaurant. Well, you know, maybe things would change, like you said, with them putting that movie out, the awareness just on a platform like this, um, helping people to realize that what's going on with their fellow sisterhood, you know, mm -hmm. and people could start to boycott restaurants. I shouldn't say that, but people would. But it's it's true. I mean, it's true. I've actually surprisingly um, a few reviews that I've posted publicly um, about restaurants. I've actually had female employees privately message me and say, please don't support that business. They allow sexual harassment. They allow this. They, allow, you know, they don't treat their women employees. I've actually had to go through and like delete my content because I stand behind that. If, if someone's going out of their way to say something just about some regular restaurant, obviously there has to be some truth behind that. And, and I'm not going to stand behind it because I've lived it personally. And a lot of people did not listen. And that's why I'm loving the awareness being brought to it now. Because when I told these stories 10 years ago, no one believed me. Not a soul. See, I, I'm like this. I don't want to just see a beautiful plate put before me when I'm at my restaurant. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what's going on in the kitchen because, yeah. because you bring me a plate that looks really good. And, it, and like they say, plate it up, <laughs> plate it up for them, make it look good. You yeah. know? But when you plated this up, what was going on with the plate before it got to my table? Yes. That's what I'm interested in. Now, and that, and that's the, and that's the thing too. I, I mean, I hate to say this, but I feel like women, we put so much passion behind the food um, that we cook. And you can tell it on a plate. You can tell that there's love. We have a level of like cleanliness that, you know, we follow <laughs> everything. And, and, and the funny part about that is, is a, um, a kitchen job that I had, um, a culinary buddy of mine had got me the job. He was my boss, um, but he did not want to listen to anything that I had to say about when I walked into it. I walked into this building and I looked and I said, that's a health code violation. That's a health code violation. We're going to get shut down. I said, I understand that like we've got to serve these people. But I said, we need to get this kitchen clean now. Didn't want to listen. Didn't want to listen. Kept bringing it up. Health inspector comes, shuts us down, says, shut it down. This needs to be clean. You can't function with this. this like, look at all of it. I said, I'm just saying. <laughs> Wait a minute. So you're saying that these men that went to culinary school, they probably can make a good dish. But you're saying that maybe they're not following the codes of cleanliness as much as the female. Yeah, that, that's what I've seen personally. This is my own personal experiences okay. that I've seen over time is and I've worked in 12 restaurants. OK, so you're not saying all men are probably. No, not I'm not protocol. saying all. This is your personal observation. Okay. My personal observation is that us women, we have been more cleanly. We've been we take more pride um, in putting out stuff that looks good. A lot of these restaurants I, I've seen just I'll spare you. I've seen just some the nastiest things that I say what is going on? Like th we've got to get on this. You, and that's the first thing you always have to know when you go in somewhere, it's not, let me hurry up and pump out this food. It's no, you need a clean station. You need clean everything. And I mean, it was just atrocious. The things that I have seen that I, and I should be a health inspector at this point. But. Let me tell you something right now. Okay. So just in my own personal life, just, just dealing with me and my husband. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm raised to um, you go into school, um, home economics, and they're teaching you all this stuff. He, he wasn't going to, to those kind of things when he was growing up, those kind of right. things. 
So it's like when I go in the kitchen, um, I'm not cooking anything until my whole kitchen is clean. All the dishes got to be either put out the dish rack or they either got to be stacked in there. Yes. And counters are in. My husband can come in there and just start cooking. And, and he don't care if, if dishes are still laying around. He's just going to find a spot and he right. can make some eggs and all that. But the other thing I find is I was taught the order of operation, right? So the yes. order of operation is you don't wash a pot and pan before you wash a glass because a glass is not going to be used to cook with. Because, you know, when you wash a pot and pan, you know, that's more dirtier than mm -hmm. a glass. So you're going to have the order of operations for when you're cooking, when you're, when you're cleaning. Um, you're going to make sure you cut up the vegetables before you do the meat. Yep. I don't think men really think about that kind of stuff. No, they, they just go in and they say, here we go and here, here we do it. And, you know, and if you watch a lot of these um, shows where like Gordon Ramsay or John Taffer, Bar Rescue, whatever, they go into these restaurants, right? And they're like, it's filthy, it's dirty. Who do you always see as the owner of these places? A man. You yeah. rarely, you rarely, rarely, rarely see women owners. It, it, it's about, I can count on one hand how many times he's gone into a strictly woman owned business, any of them, and said, it's filthy here, it's dirty here. You're giving and me that's just facts. So now when I see a man in the kitchen, I might not want to, I mean, I, like, I'm not going to say I'm going to eat at an, <laughs> an establishment. That's all <laughs> I'm talking about like mom and pop restaurants. Yeah, but you're going to be cautious. Yeah, well, they're generally like, family owned mm -hmm. with hops, right? yeah and and i will tell you surprisingly some of those mom and pop restaurants take their cleanliness serious mm -hmm. because they're smaller they have a target on them um and they have a stigma of being if you're a diner or whatever you have that stigma of oh it's probably greasy spoon you know dirty place so most of them actually do a really great job of, of upkeep and making sure it's clean and, and your station's good. Um, and I've worked at a couple of places like that. Just the management was awful, but they were very on you about the cleanliness and making sure they're good because they wanted to live up to that standard. Right. So now it's just bringing awareness, you know, and making sure you're cautious and when you go out, you know, just be mindful. Right. Look at little things. Well, well, you're giving me a big education here because like I said, I mean, I do watch. Now, when I go to a, like a short order cook, maybe I'm at a diner where mm -hmm. I'm at like a, a deli. Mm -hmm. And what I will do is from the moment I enter the deli in the line to order my sandwich, I watch what happens to the rag. I watch how often they clean the knife. Mm -hmm. I watch how they interact with different things in those little bins and whether or not they're, you know, like allowing certain foods to contaminate other foods. Yep. And each other. I'm watching all of that. Mm -hmm. And my husband said, he can't believe I go out to eat. He mm -hmm. said, because you don't see what they're doing behind the kitchen. Because right yeah. behind the deli, I can see all that. Oh, said, yeah. You know, would hit the floor before they put it back on your plate, you know, but that's why you have a little glass of wine. <laughs> yeah, right. Or, exactly. You know? Exactly. And, and the funny thing is, is um, my mom, she used to go when she would go to Chipotle. Um, sometimes she would watch how they would make the food. Right. And she would get a worker and she would be like, I don't like the way you made my food. You, you don't. I don't like the attitude, the way that it was made. So I don't feel like it was made with love. And, and there's just stuff everywhere. Could you remake it? Oh my God. <laughs> or give me somebody else. And you know what? It's like, honestly, I mean, I'm like, mom, just let it go. But at the same time, it's like when you watch somebody just in front of you and they're just uh, 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 with your food. And it's like, at this, I don't even want it. You know? Exactly. Well, you know, I feel like, you know, if I work in a paper mill or I work in a, a store where I'm just, you know, like stacking Kleenex on a, on a, on a shelf or something, mm -hmm. you know, you're not getting ready to eat that. When no, you right. start teaching, when you start treating my food like it's a log that is going to be put on a fire and get ready to be, you know, like you know, in my in my fireplace, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to get some some um, some fire and it's going to get some, 
you know, some cleanly, uh, it's going to get clean with the, with the fire, right? Yes. You start messing with my food that ain't getting ready to go through that kind of a process, then we got problems, you know? Correct, and exactly. So, um, I try to, you know, I try, I like to eat out because sometimes I don't like cooking. So right. I am, I am a person that will keep a small business in business. Hello. Okay. But I'm also the kind of person that probably don't need to be in that business because I'm so picky and, and, and persnickety about. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know and, and, and I want people to know too, don't like, don't feel uncomfortable speaking about what you see. Because that's why those people are staying in business is because people are afraid to say, um, no, that glass is, is dirty. These canisters that are holding this, you know, sugar, cream, whatever, eh, there's spilled coffee and stuff all up. And no, listen, at some point it is OK to speak up and let people know, like, I just could you wipe down this table? My seat still has stuff from the previous, you know, people. I have never in in all the years that I have worked in this industry, I will never be afraid to call them out and come and clean something because you have all these employees. I mean, that is that is actually a part of your job description. We're not telling you to do something that's not a part of your job description. It's how you approach it. But there's absolutely nothing wrong with making sure that you mention to these people like. This you might want to can you write this down or can you give me a fresh one of these or I'm telling you that's... and I think especially during COVID because you know I'm just I don't I'm not gonna even mention things I don't want to give anybody any, any ideas but mm-hmm. I watch everything when I go places mm-hmm. it's gonna be like I don't know if I want to eat that or I'll find a way that you know when I go out. I will find a way that I'm going to order something that I can only use a, a spoon or fork to eat with. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes, you know, I can't find a place. I may have gone into their restroom and I don't see that there's any soap in the bathroom. Mm-hmm. Of course, I probably shouldn't even be eating in there, right? Right. Uh, yeah. Find a way. Because I mean, sometimes you're traveling. Yeah. And you don't have a choice. You don't have to. You can't just walk out of there because you don't been driving for five or six hours and you in the middle of nowhere. You got to grab something to eat. So you try to eat with, you try not to eat with your hands if you don't have mm-hmm. to. And Correct. one of my girlfriends told me that when her mother couldn't get someplace and wash her hands, she would eat her French fry all the way up to the part where she touched and okay. then started. <laughs> and I said, that sounds like something I would do, but I'm just saying, I'm just giving people some ideas. Yeah. I I've never in a situation where you can't, you know, get to a clean the, place to wash your hands. The simplest, the simplest thing will make you know if you're in a good restaurant or not. And that's their bathroom. Yeah. The cleanliness of their bathroom will tell you everything you need to know about an establishment. Well, yeah, that's true. Period. (laughs) And and that's even something they taught us in culinary school. You go, you walk in somewhere, check out your surroundings. Don't be afraid to leave somewhere if you're not feeling, you know, what it's all about. Obviously, you can look on the outside and tell if this place is promising or not. Because, hey, listen, we all love a good comfort soul food mom and pop place. We love it, okay? I love to smell that smoke and all that from outside, you know, and everything. But if if you're not taking pride in your business, that means you're not taking pride in your food either. So if you're if your establishment is filthy, then the food level ain't going to be there either, regardless of, oh, this gym, it's, you know, in this area, I know it looks a little sketchy or it might not be the best looking on the outside, but it's so good. OK, well, when you get food poisoning from them contaminating things and not washing their hands or doing, you know, proper protocol, then I don't want to hear it. <laughs> You got to be so careful. And like I said, especially during the time of the pandemic and, you know, now that they're getting ready to start lifting things and, and people are going to start opening it. Well, things are open now. Yeah, right. Uh, I know here in where I'm at in Maryland, um, they are going to start opening up, I think, July 2nd. Oh, OK. And, and, and they're going to cancel the re- requirement for masks. I mean, there's some uh-huh. places that are telling people that they have if they're fully vaccinated, they can go right. with a mask. But it's still protocols you got to take. Correct. So, you know, yeah, it's it's very um, there's just a lot of tedious things in the in the restaurant industry and the food business that a lot of people don't realize because they haven't been in it. Um, And that's just what I wanted to do even today is, you know, just bring a lot of awareness of 
what goes on behind the scenes and what you really need to know, because I'm finding out more and more that a lot of these people don't know. Right. Not even thinking about it. I mean, because I don't know what made me aware of different things, but I do know growing up as a kid, I literally did not like potato salad. And the reason why is because every time my mom and we would go to a cookout, that somebody in the family would get sick. And what you find out is the people that um, had the potato salad, for some reason, it was always sitting in a window in the sun. And so yes. like, it's not being stored properly. Correct. I grew up hating potato salad. Yes, I, that's fair. I older and I was making it myself and I stored it properly. Then I was like, okay, I could eat this, but because I made it, because I stored it out of the sun. You know, I didn't have it in the sun. And these Correct. are the things that people got to look at when they go to cookouts. You Correct. Know? I refuse to do potlucks and and cookouts and things like that because <laughs> I've seen it all too, homegirl. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's bad. Wow. So, th- so give a shout out to your um your social media uh, pages so that the viewing audience can come and check out your food and see what's going on with Chef Nelly. Absolutely. So I am on. Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube. So you just need to search Nellie's, that's with an S at the end, Nellie's Odds and Eats. Search that up. You guys will not be disappointed with the easy recipes that I show you. Something quick to make for the family if you're on the go or you don't have the time. That's what I'm there to show you. Quick, easy recipes that don't require too much and with stuff you already have in your home. So definitely check out. <laughs> awesome. I want to thank you so much for being on the program, Chef Nelly. And I want to have thank you on for you. a future episode. And we'll talk about some other topics at that time. Absolutely. I'm. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. This is excellent. Thank you so much. You're okay, welcome. Take excellent. care. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thanks so much for listening to Hidden Struggles with your host, Lady C. This program was sponsored by Critical Thinkers online at hiddenstruggle.com. Feel free to send an email to info at hiddenstruggle.com and we'll catch you next time on Hidden Struggles. The views and opinions of our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Critical Thinkers.